Great. Uh, Let me introduce you, actually, Simone. Yeah. Okay. Um, I may also have to restart this thing. But, yeah. Um, so Simone is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard and will be starting as a Veblen research instructor at Princeton and the IAS in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, he received his PhD in math from Columbia in 2021. His interests are in symplectic geometry as well as applications of math at the intersection of machine learning and physics. Simone has done some really interesting research uh, connected to machine learning uh, over the past few years, and it's a pleasure uh, really to have him tell us today about his most recent work with uh, Jordan Kotler connecting RG and optimal transport. Um, Simone, please take it away. All right, thank you for that very warm introduction. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, the work is titled uh, Renormalization Group Flows Optimal Transport. It's a paper on the archive. And everything I'm saying is joined with Jordan Kotler. Uh, I'm at the math department at Harvard, and he's at the physics department. Um, so let's, the first thing I just want to say, just to sort of frame the discussion, is that this is really like a theory talk. It's a theoretical physics talk. It's not a math talk. Um, the thing I'm, the things, the things I'll be saying, uh, they do have, uh, at least in part, rigorous mathematical counterparts, which are very interesting. But, you know, everything is in a certain kind of like theoretical physics formalism. Uh, and we, you know, while there are computations that we've sort of done, we have in the paper, they're symbolic. Uh, and, you know, they're not kind of like numerical computations using like existing machine learning methods. But uh, one of my motivations for giving this talk and for thinking about the subject is that I think the formalism that I'm going to describe, well, I hope at least that it will be useful for uh, designing machine learning methods. Uh, with an eye towards physics applications. So uh, that's sort of the purpose of this kind of discussion for me. Um, all right, so let's take it away. So I'm gonna sort of start reminding you of the various terms in the title. Uh, so the renormalization group is some collection of, you know, sort of physical intuitions, uh, both formal and also like kind of actual computational methods, which aim to describe how the effective description of a physical system changes as you tune the precision of a measurement kind of, of, of your measurement apparatus. That's the fundamental physical question that this uh, object tries to answer. And uh, I'm just going to give you a short review in case um, you sort of aren't so familiar with this. So imagine that you have some kind of statistical system on a lattice. So maybe there are spins that point up and down, and maybe you have a kind of an ambient magnetization, which is trying to get them to point in some direction, uh, or maybe they, uh, and maybe the spins also interact on neighboring lattice sites. So then uh, from this kind of like microscopic description, you can write some kind of Hamiltonian, which is supposed to describe the probability that the system is in a given state. So if you label the spins Ji, or I runs over the lattice, then maybe the Hamiltonian looks something like the quantity below. And you, um, let me see if I can write something. Okay, the idea is that the probability of some configuration is, um, you know, something like e to the minus um, beta h j, where j is the inverse temperature, divided by a normalizing constant. That's the sort of basic thing you should imagine. You have a statistical kind of extended physical system. Now. What you can do, this is maybe the original idea, is you can try to block the, uh, the regions of the lattice and get a coarser lattice. And you can try to find a Hamiltonian, another description. And then, you know, so this gives you for each kind of configuration J, you get a new set of averaged configurations J twiddle. Or maybe you do some kind of max pool operation where you take the most likely spin in any given four by four block. And uh, what you try to do is you try to write down a new Hamiltonian, H1, which best captures the physics of the original Hamiltonian. Uh, one way that people sometimes formalize that is by asking that uh, sort of expectation values uh, with respect to E to the uh, beta H1 of these sort of various products of these uh, uh, averaged quantities, these are all the same as expectation values with respect to the original Hamiltonian. Oh, gosh, sorry. 
expectation values with respect to the original Hamiltonian of the uh, averages of these quantities. So that's sort of a condition on how you would derive H1, and sometimes you can then write an H1 that satisfies this condition. Okay. So when you, it turns out you can generally do that, uh, and from that kind of, as you iterate this procedure, you jet a single Hamiltonian generates you a sequence of Hamiltonians depending on a scale, which we might denote by T or lambda or L. I'll describe the relationships between those in a bit. And uh, from that, you get this idea that given any particular theory, you have a whole kind of flow of theories in the space of theories. So there's a nice plot on the right here um, where, you know, maybe there's some infinite dimensional space describing the couplings of your Hamiltonian H. And then uh, you, if you start with a theory, you sort of flow somewhere. And then it's very interesting to study the fixed points of this flow that corresponds to theories which are scale invariant. It's very interesting to look near a fixed point to see um, which are the kind of operators which are blowing up or getting the, the terms which are getting smaller or bigger. That's going to tell you something about the, um, I guess, the most important quantities to study in a given system. And um, I don't know, there's just been a lot of, this is like basically one of the basic engines of statistical and quantum field theory. So notions like, um, uh, notions like phase transitions and so forth are all described through this language. And uh, the basic point of the language is that it explains how the long range physics and the short range physics are connected. Okay, so that's some sort of high level overview. So, uh, one thing we, it's a little bit complicated. I mean, the, the actual implementation of this idea has a lot of kind of, there's a lot of technology that goes into it. And so it's interesting, at least to occasionally ask yourself more basic questions, like what does their normalization group mean from like a kind of more fundamental computational perspective or an information theoretic perspective? Uh, and separately, uh, because it's so important to uh, sort of the structure of physical theories, uh, it's interesting and uh, people have, I guess gotten a lot of mileage out of the structure of physical theories in the context of machine learning, it's interesting to ask what's the sort of natural place where kind of modern machine learning perspectives and the normalization group fit together in some sort of coherent framework. Um, and so the sort of this talk aims to at least make progress uh, on these two questions. So let's uh, to sort of talk about this stuff um, without all these lattices. Uh, to kind of write more simpler formula, we have to go to the continuum. So let's suppose you have a Euclidean scalar field theory in D dimensions. Let's say you even imagine you have one scalar field phi, although there might be more. So then the scalar field theory specifies some kind of probability functional, which is proportional to whatever this sort of Hamiltonian term. Um, and this, this probability functional depends on lambda. Uh, where lambda is the sort of parameter in the normalization group. And you should think of this as some sort of density that you want to sample from if you're just a machine learning person. And uh, the relationship between the parameter lambda and some sort of physical length scale is lambda is approximately one over L, where L is the length scale. And the point is that not only do you have one of these distributions, you have a whole family of them, and they're all connected by an equation, which is um, sometimes called the exact renormalization group equation, which I've written out in very schematic form here. So F here is some kind of very general functional of this probability distribution on an infinite dimensional space of fields and the derivatives of that probability density. Okay. So this is all very old. This goes back to the sort of beginnings of uh, the ideas about the renormalization group. Um, and uh, the reason it's sort of so important to think about this stuff is because, well, first of all, you need the normalization group to even make sense of how you define the theory, because there are some kind of like divergences for basic aspects of physical field theories at the sort of UV at sort of very short length scales. Um, it also gives it's some tool again for getting some insight into the physics, like the phase transitions in your system and so forth. And finally, it's just a kind of historically uh, very efficient way of organizing computations of physical theories, um, both from a symbolic perspective and from a numerical perspective. Um, so it's not just some framework, there's really some content to it. And uh, I just wanna show you what one of the versions of this exact normalization group equation is. So it's exact meaning as opposed to perturbative. Um, it's some sort of 
uh, supposed to be the, the sort of true version of the normalization group equation. This is called the Polchinski equation. This goes back to this paper of Polchinski's. And uh, S int here is meant to be like you look at the action, but you don't look, look at the quadratic term. You look at the rest of the terms. And you can see this looks like some sort of second order differential operator acting on the interaction term. Um, so this is what uh, uh, the Polchinski flow equation says. That's how these probability functionals are supposed to be connected. And there are later uh, more general versions of this. Uh, one, we dug the Wagner-Morris flow equation. Uh, I won't go uh, into this in, in that much detail unless you guys ask me later, but this kind of, this is uh, here, phi, here phi C lambda is some particular expression depending on P. Um, and it, uh, this is a sort of a more general version of the exact normalization group equation, which in particular can be sort of applied to gauge theories, then made gauge invariant and so forth. That was the original motivation for this uh, equation. And uh, let, let's just jump to the point. Here's what we did. We took that equation and we reformulated in these terms. So what you say is that that, origin, that equation, either the Polchinski equation or this more general Wegner-Morris equation, can be written as the right-hand side of it can be written as the Wasserstein two gradient of a relative entropy functional with respect to a certain background prior distribution. So that's that's the, more or less the punchline of the paper that the normalization group is equivalent to some kind of optimal transport gradient flow uh, for probability densities on the space of fields. All right, so uh, let me go and explain the basic logic. So this is somewhat satisfying because uh, maybe I said we should find some kind of information theoretic interpretation of the normalization group. And here, at least, various quantities related to information theory are appearing in the formulation. Um, so let's go over the logic of how you might decide to think about this. Uh, well, the Polchinski equation, you just saw it. There's this S in term and this some sort of second order differential operator. In other words, it's sort of a type of heat flow. Um, approximately. I mean, there's some, you know, I didn't have the quadratic term and so forth, but it looks a little bit like a heat flow. Now, it's known that you can think of a heat flow as an optimal transport gradient flow with respect to entropy, uh, and I'm going to review that idea in a second. So therefore, you kind of compose these two ideas and hope that maybe this makes sense in infinite dimensions. And so that was, you know, we decided to explore that, and lo and behold, this you can make sense of this uh, in quite a bit of generality. So first, I'm going to, to make sure this all makes sense. I'm going to review the uh, sort of optimal transport. We've just reviewed the basics of the exact normalization group. Then I'll explain how we generalize this sort of finite dimensional idea to the infinite dimensional setting and some of the modifications that uh, gives rise to. Then I'll talk about monotones for their normalization group. The point is the entropy, this relative entropy is some kind of monotone. And that was part of our motivation from a theoretical perspective. It's interesting to look for monotones under RG flow. Um, from it, because that's been an interesting question historically. Um, then I'll talk about how you can sort of think about this variationally and maybe some um, some sort of directions for how to make this idea more applied in sort of a numerical setting, and then we can discuss. All right. So, by the way, uh, you guys should feel free to ask questions, um, and I'm happy to take them uh, as we go, uh, unless it's a long question, in which case maybe I'll address it at the end. Okay. okay. So let me remind you of how optimal transport works. So this is a very old idea going back to like Mon from 1781. He was uh, interested in protecting Paris against the revolutionaries. Uh, so suppose you have two different uh, probability distributions in the same space, P of X and Q of X. Uh, and you, then you, what, the problem is to find a transport map from the space to itself. So the push forward of the first distribution is the second one. And there isn't just one such transport map. You want to find the best one. So you introduce a cost, which is basically um, the cost it takes to take an infinitesimal unit of mass from one point in your space to another point in your space. That's its function C. And then you minimize, well, that quantity. So for you take, um, you take P of X, you divide it into little pieces, and you move it according to T. And then you measure the cost of each of that movement. OK. So that's one formulation. One downside of this formulation is that this is this kind of quantity on the bottom right is a very 
nonlinear functional of t because of this condition that the push forward of p is q. That's just a nonlinear condition on t. So Kantorovich, uh, a little while later, uh, uh, when he was trying to help the Soviet Union, um, reformulated this problem in a somewhat different way. You still have the same initial and final distributions, but instead of having a transport map, you have a transport kernel, which now is a kind of a distribution of two variables, which marginal, marginalizes out to your two distributions. You still have the same cost and you minimize this quantity. Uh, and the point is that this new functional um, is a convex relaxation of your original functional. So in fact, I mean, if you have these, two, these con constraints on pi are now linear constraints, and this is a linear functional, so this is just a linear programming problem. And the point is that if you choose, uh, let me again, I can still write, if you choose like pi of x, y equals uh, t is sort of like p of x, as the delta function at y equals t of x, then uh, the contorative functional becomes the Monge functional. So there's sort of more, now you're allowed to, instead of taking a single point and moving it to a single point, you're allowed to take a point and like subdivide the mass there into some way and move it around however you want. But it turns out that in many cases, the optimal solution for the, um, the Kantorovich functional is actually of the form that I wrote in red. So it actually comes from a solution to the Monge functional. That's some sort of very general phenomenon uh, that doesn't always occur, but there are known conditions when it does occur. Okay. So from this, you get this idea of the Wasserstein distance. So this is something a bunch of people are probably familiar with. It's this quantity. It's just like given two distributions, what is uh, the, uh, the cost of the optimal transport map between them? Where here I've chosen the cost to be uh, Cxy is x minus y squared, sort of very natural Euclidean distance metric. And this distance has popped up in a lot of places. Uh, in the machine learning community, I think it was popularized by this Wasserstein GAN paper um, from 2017, uh, although it's also been used in a lot of different places, basically because it's a basic tool to compare probability distributions. There's lots of work on like approximating efficiently or computing it efficiently and so forth. Um, and so it's you know, reasonably useful in general for kind of questions about generative model. Um, so people have thought about it quite a bit in different communities. Okay. So now I mentioned to you that the heat flow is a gradient flow with respect to the entropy. This is, uh, first I wanna remind you of a simpler version of this. So if you had the heat equation, what does it mean that it's a gradient flow? Well, you need to specify the function that you, uh, the, the heat flow is a gradient flow in many different ways. Uh, so you need to specify the function whose gradient you're taking. One function you could take is this Dirichlet energy functional, which is given by this expression. Um, you need to specify the space of probability distributions. Oh, sorry. That's uh, just sort of functions which integrate to one. Um, and then the tangent space to that is clearly uh, functions which average out to zero. And to take the gradient of a function, you need to specify a metric. So the most obvious metric is the L2 metric. This is independent of the point or distribution P, although it might be dependent in general. And then what you can do is you can take the gradient of this quantity, uh, this functional with respect to this metric. What that means is that you like you differentiate it in P, you get grad P, grad PT. Then you use the you integrate by parts, and you see that you get integral Laplace P or minus Laplace P times uh, D, derivative of p with respect to t. So what that means, that's exactly the sort of, uh, that's telling you, that's just exactly the definition then of the gradient of this functional being minus the Laplace operator, which means that the heat flow is clearly a gradient flow of this Dirichlet energy functional with respect to the flat L2 metric. Okay, this is a very kind of basic computation. Now, there's a different way of seeing the heat flow as a gradient flow. So this took like 100 years for some reason for people to understand. It was known to Gibbs that the heat flow is a, uh, the entropy is kind of monotonic under heat flow, but really finding the right metric took a while. So um, you have this quantity, the entropy, uh, the differential entropy of a distribution. But now you need to write down the right metric. So this is a metric this to e to two functions which average out to zero gives you a number which depends on the uh, 
probability distribution P. So the metric now depends on your point in your manifold. And the way you solve for uh, eta bar given eta is you solve this equation. You solve this sort of like modified inverse Laplace equation. Okay. So this is just um, a definition of an inner product. And it turns out by some, you know, not completely elementary computation, but I guess we, at least if you look at our paper, we give a very short, um, very standard uh, motivation for this definition. This is the infinitesimal version of this Wasserstein 2 metric. Um, so that thing gave a distance between two points, you need to differentiate it um, to get the sort of, you need to expand it quadratically to second order, and then you get this quantity. And uh, there's some computation you could do to see that uh, the gradient of this entropy functional with respect to this new metric is uh, also the Laplacian, and thus you get that the um, the gradient flow of this, the key equation is also the gradient flow of the entropy with respect to the Wasserstein metric. All right, so this is all old stuff. Cool. So let's remind you of the flow of logic. The Polchinski equation is kind of like a heat flow. Maybe you saw that in this expression. Heat flow now is, we know in finite dimensions, the optimal transport kind of problem with respect to entropy, okay? So uh, let's try to make sense of, let's see how well this works in the infinite dimensional context. Okay. So, okay, let's just start writing down formally all of the quantities we saw before. We have this initial and final distribution. These are now distributions on the space of fields. P is a field. I just want you to kind of fix that notation in your mind. You have this kernel pi. Let's kind of think about it in this Kantorovich way. Why not? It's supposed to marginalize out as follows. There's some cost functional. You want to write down this minimization problem. That's all, and formally no problems with that. Question is, what exactly is the cost functional? So we write something down. It looks like this. This is the, the Wasserstein distance you get if you choose the right cost functional. Um, so here on the bottom right, I want to you want to draw your attention to two terms, two things. One of them is uh, this. This is the analog of the distance between two fields, right? The Euclidean different distance between two fields. Okay, is integral. And the second term is this term. This is a little bit interesting. This is some metric on the space of fields, which depends on lambda. And what it is, it's called the ERG kernel. So this pops up in this literature on their exact normalization group. And the way you should think about it is that it's like, it's specifying how you're cutting off your propagator. Okay, so in this story about the normalization group, the point is that you're supposed to, for each lambda, you're supposed to suppress fluctuations of your fields at sort of scale uh, larger than lambda, and so for any particular lambda, you ask how much does that suppression change? So that's what this quantity is. It looks sort of like this, okay? And so what did I say? I mean, you guys saw that formula. There's this Wasserstein distance, that's here. Okay, I've written it for you. There's the probability functional I care about. That's the usual probability functional field theory. There's some background distribution. The natural one to take, at least for the Polchinski equation, is this distribution, which is like, you know, very re closely related to the distribution for the free field theory, but you put a two in the action. Okay? And there's the sort of formal relative entropy quantity, sort of makes sense. And uh, this, sorry, this is the exact expression. So here, um, yeah, this is the exact expression for uh, this ERG kernel. Um, K lambda here is this cutoff function, uh, how you cut off your sort of fluctuations. And uh, what you can get- I a, Can I ask yeah. a question actually? Um, yeah. So if you go back to the thing, the, the equation that just disappeared, mm -hmm. basically choosing a metric on the space of field configurations. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on why that is the right or appropriate choice of metric? Um, well, it, for me, we, 
do this because it reproduces, and we cho so chose this because it reproduces the, um, I mean, it gives you the result we were looking for. Um, I, this metric pops up in other, I mean, I don't, I, I'm, I'm thinking about what's the best way to answer this question. I mean, this metric is part of the way that you specify your RG flow. Um, I mean, that's it just sort of pops up naturally if you think about the, like the Polchinski equation is some kind of heat equation, and then it's a heat equation with respect to some metric. So this is very much related to that metric, if that makes sense. Is that okay? Um, but usually when I do field theory path integrals, um, yeah. here, I'm done eating my lunch, so I'll turn my video on. Um, usually when, we do field theory path integrals. We're doing integrals over field spaces of the sort that you're considering. Now, mm -hmm. when you define W2, you're doing an integral over, a, you're doing a pair of field theory path integrals. But are there any other contexts where the metric that you've defined in terms of C lambda appears? Like if I just do a normal field theory path integral, am I doing it with respect? Like that defines a, yeah. Okay. So I guess. Is your statement is just that this is the metric that you need to take in order to get the answer that is the Polchinski equation? Is that? Uh, well, basic? for any ERG type flow, there is a formula of this kind which will reproduce it. So the, okay. the point is that you can think about specifying RG flow as specifying two bit two things. One is a time dependent family of metrics on field space. Um, which are, and the second one is this background distribution. And that seems to represent or kind of reproduce anything we can find. Um, and there's metrics that are like, you know, these are very simple metrics, right? These are kind of linear on the whole space of fields if you have a linear field space. Um, does that okay. sort of answer the question? Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to discuss later. Okay, so uh, the statement is that if you take this expression, then this gives you exactly the Polchinski equation, which is the sort of basic result. And if you generalize this, instead of this free field theory as your background distribution, you take a more general field theory, then there's this term called the seed action that appears in this exact normalization group literature. And in that case, you get this Wagner-Morris equation. Um, so that was sort of satisfying for us that the seed action, which look, comes in a somewhat mysterious way, uh, in the formula actually should just really be thought of as this background distribution um, with respect to which kind of gets plugged into the entropy. Uh, to sort of clarify this factor of two in particular. Yeah, can you, uh, sorry, quick question. Can you also comment a little bit on how I should think about the S hat um, just in, in terms of like, you know, being familiar with field theory, but not necessarily being familiar with the formalism, so. Uh, Maybe I, I'm not sure what to say right now about that either. Uh, yes. It's just a term that appears in, uh, I mean, this ERG, uh, in part for this, we were interested in trying to reformulate some of the four expressions in the ERG literature in a way that was more familiar. Is it, should I think of S hat as, so if I think about phi to the four theory, uh, yeah. SS lambda as the, as the original theory that I'm mm -hmm. interested in, is how really, what would the seed action look like for, for such? The seed action is part of the way you specify your ERG scheme. So it's, I mean, there's many different, if you have a field theory that doesn't specify a unique RG scheme. Does that make sense? I mean, there's many RG schemes for any particular field theory. You have to specify like how you're cutting off your fields. And now some things are independent of RG scheme and that's important. Yeah. Yeah, I care about the things that are independent. I mean, physical. Okay, things. sure. I mean, that makes sense. Many the different, yeah, so then you could choose maybe a seed action for which the RG is particularly convenient. People in the RG literature, literature do this. Okay, and the factor of two is somehow just to match. Uh, there's no... Uh... I mean, I'll, you'll, you'll, you'll see what it gives you in a second. Okay? Yes, thanks. Cool. Uh, may I uh, ask a stupid question? Uh, uh, on the right-hand side of the Wigner morris equation, um, the gradient acts on P, is that correct? Yes. And Q is fixed. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Q depends on lambda. Yeah. Okay. Yes. May 
ask another clarif a naive clarifying question about the this background or or what you you called it the yeah. prior earlier so it's not the it, should i can i think of it as the initial uh field theory that i start with no, no. so in general if you started with the four theory to reproduce the polchinski flow you would choose still the free theory as your background i mean rg in many ways privileges the free theory uh, at least normally and so that's not that surprising so, mm -hmm. so you're not you're not supposed to think of it as either the ir or the uv no it's not okay. it have to be that it's an interesting subtle point um i'll discuss this later and, but you know there's a phenomenon where like rg flows want to flow to the free field even though they don't always so it's sort of part of that um so let me mention some differences okay i'll just skip ahead here so first of all uh, the Polchinski equation is not like literally a heat equation, it's some kind of infinite dimensional re reaction diffusion equation. The Wagner Morris flow is even more general, but all these computations really do make sense in that level of generality, at least for scalar field theories. Um, there are some subtleties also with the space of probability functionals. Uh, in particular, like if you do a hard cutoff, then maybe this actual space of probability functionals changes. So we have some discussion about at least one regime where we think we understand all the details. Um, and uh, it's also important for this argument to go through uh, that the ERG kernel has some kind of positivity properties, um, which is actually like if you try to generalize this uh, is going to be important uh, because uh, this sort of positivity, um, like right, like I have a positive function um, for this C dot, uh, that's going to be, I guess, a crucial point of like when this whole formalism works um, in much more general settings. Um, okay. So uh, one thing that I just want to mention is that this sort of general formula is robust uh, to uh, the process of trying to put your theory on a lattice, like the arguments really do more or less go through. Um, and I'll discuss that also later. And so here is one thing about this factor of two. If you look at the RG flow of free massive scalar field theory, respect to the Polchinski equation, then this is the equation that you get that sort of the Polchinski equation could be characterized essentially as saying it's the flow of this form for which the free theory flows according to its own entropy. Which is, yeah, at least is a satisfying equation. So this is sort of why that factor of two is important. If that factor of two wasn't there, it's right hand side would be zero. The free theory would be fixed. Okay. So one reason why you might see these relative entropies popping up, just even reasoning very heuristically, is that it's sort of implausible that in general, um, you would like really have the actual entropy um, because it doesn't even make sense in the continuum. This is a standard point, um, but the relative entropy does make sense, um, you know, respect to units and stuff. Uh, and so that it turns out that when you look at this more general ERG formalism, uh, this, uh, sort of this phenomenon really kind of meshes very well with that um, and that the seed action which appears really is sort of should be thought of as the sort of background um, distribution in this kale divergence um, which so this rg scheme is specified by choosing a background distribution and a metric on the space of fields um, that's kind of a different way of thinking about neuralization group okay so now let me tell you uh one of the theoretical motivations that we had um, so this, this equation that we wrote down, it suggests that something like the relative entropy um, should be some kind of monotone, some sort of well-defined, fairly general monotone under RG flow. And uh, this is a question that people have thought about quite a bit. So there's a whole kind of literature on interesting quantities which are monotonic under RG flow. There's the famously the zomologic of C theorem and for 2D theories. And then there's sort of the Cardi A theorem for 4D. And there's another class of uh, entropies like this. And these are all these are a little more refined in a sense. Um, they also depend technically on so both in both cases these the, whatever monotone you get is dependent on your choice of RG scheme. Um, but you know certain aspects of it are independent, and that can that can act if you really want to be precise. That takes some work to pick out. Um, and our uh, monotone is really of a very qualitatively different form from the other kinds, and we sort of invest, investigated it in some concrete cases. So. You want to take this quantity, this relative entropy minus the log of this uh, of one of the normalization factors, and then what we check is that its logarithmic derivative is positive. Okay. And the proof involves of like 
the sort of analog positivity of some analog of the Fisher information and sort of this sort of positivity aspect of the ERG kernel. And it's a little bit subtle because now we're doing like path integrals where there are kind of logs involved. And so there are some subtleties about orders of limits being part because naively speaking, these quantities are very badly divergent. Um, and so part of the work in our paper is to make sense in which just discuss, discuss like how you would regularize these quantities uh, to make them uh, more finite. Okay, so I, I'm going to, so the, the part that's best regularized is just the derivative. Um, so uh, basically when you take this monotone, it all, often looks very infinite, but the derivative has very meaningful finite parts. It looks sort of like this, where this is some kind of contact term. This is something like the volume of your, of your, of the space so it looks like a volume of r to the d so maybe this is finite if you put it on a lattice or a finite lattice or on a torus uh, and then you have a manifestly finite term and then that manifestly finite term itself is finite um, so it's positive that's what we kind of check which means that uh, if you take an antiderivative of this right hand side uh, that's sort of really what we mean by our monotone so we regularize a sort of naively divergent quantity by Making its derivative manifest, its derivative is manifestly finite. So there's a, um, its antiderivative is that a monotone. Okay. So like we really think through this in some examples. We looked at, for example, a free scalar field. This is what the sort of formally what our monotone looks like, and this is divergent for kind of any way of cutting things off that's like remotely plausible. Um, but its derivative uh, is uh, actually this right hand side is uh, finite for um, some very large class of kind of cutoff kernels, which we describe. And, you know, we also do some computations in uh, scalar field theory. So let me just write down like the propagator and a bunch of other similar looking terms that sort of pop up when you try to compute this quantity perturbatively. Then uh, this derivative sort of decrease in the in this relative entropy looks like this um, up to for the first few terms up to lambda cubed. Um, for feet of the four theory. Uh, so these, the, you know, the, we, we, these quantities at least can be made sense perturbatively. Um, so that, that I just wanted to show that for people who, you know, do computations in, uh, in field theories on a regular basis, to show that these, like, this stuff can be worked with symbolically. Okay. So we only work on scalar field theory in our paper. But this, uh, you know, we kind of work things out for this Wegener-Morris equation, which was invented to sort of gen make the normalization group sort of manifest the gauge invariant uh, for gauge theories. Um, and so we expect that analogs of this monotone uh, and in general, this sort of entropy type structure should exist in gen and for theories and for many gauge theories and for many theories of fermions, although that's not in our paper. Um, and it's going to be the main thing that you need to check is sort of you need to make sense of this analog of this positivity of this ERG kernel. Um, and that in particular should exclude um, certain exotic field theories. And when you've given these talks and people are like, oh, well, like, how does this relate to what I understand about normalization in my favorite cool QFT? And then when we've investigated, it turns out that like the ERG kernel is a little bit uh, exotic in that setting. Um, but for sort of most typical theories, I think this seems to be that this stuff will go through. Um, so I don't know if you want to apply this to your favorite complicated supersymmetric field theory, but for like, you know, theories about like, crystals and stuff, it seems it's probably fine. Okay. So now, um, what we said is that, okay, the RG is a gradient flow with respect to some relative entropy. So that gives you some variational formulation of the normalization group. So, um, let me just quickly remind you on something totally general. So if you have the gradient flow of a function, then you can discretize this equation. Uh, and what you can notice is that this discrete gradient flow, uh, each step is, can be, can, this discrete gradient flow is basically an Euler-Lagrange equation for an optimization problem. So what that tells you is that if you have a function, then you can approximately, you can kind of numerically uh, approximate its gradient flow uh, using what, uh, by repeatedly solving this optimization problem. Um, each time you can get the next step by 
looking for the solution. And that would be called an implicit Euler method for this differential equation. Okay. Because sort of each time the next step is defined implicitly by an auxiliary optimization problem. So we kind of work detail through to what degree this sort of specializes in this uh, kind of infinite symmetrical setup. Um, so here's some notation. Uh, the Wagner Morris flow basically says that the uh, probability functional at one scale is related to the probability functional at another scale by some kind of field reparametrization. Re so, okay, uh, with, with field reparametrizations, you also have to compute some kind of Jacobian of your field reparametrization. Um, so you just kind of give this new thing a name. And then what you get by applying this, by sort of specializing to this, uh, just writing down this implicit Euler scheme for uh, this quantity is that uh, you can kind of calculate this reparametrization for one step of RG uh, by solving this optimization problem over reparametrizations. Um, and, you know, this is this kind of general idea in some sense in finite dimensions is this like FKO scheme, um, which um, is sort of kind of one of the beginning things in the optimal transport literature. Um, but, you know, one problem with this is, you know, you have this to, to compute the uh, Wasserstein distance, you have to already do an optimization. So now we have like a lot of nested optimizations that seems hard to uh, control. But in this particular case, you can, you know, do some trick and actually reformulate the same functional in terms of a functional that only involves a single optimization. Okay. So now F here is um, sort of related to this reparametrization, um, but now it's, it's maybe the in, it's inverse. Uh, and now here you can write down the Monge functional rather than the, uh, and it's just, you know, there's no, um, this is just the functional. It's not like the distance. So this is, you can just directly evaluate it if you have access to F. And so then what you could do is if you knew how to sample from uh, the, the, what's it called? The probability functional at one scale, this at least tells you how you would kind of compute, uh, you know, like you would approximate some amount of RG uh, in any one of these different, for any one of these choices, you would do it by, you know, sampling from the probability functional at one scale and solving this optimization problem. Um, and uh, this optimization problem, as we kind of think through, if you try to discretize it, it ends up being like pretty amenable to sort of methods about the cast of gradient descent and so forth. So I'll address a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but, you know, you can solve for F and then you just like map your sample using that map. And now you've sampled from um, your uh, renormalized probability function. Okay. So now I want to say some speculative things because I think this is um, this is one of my motivations. This is why I kind of am hoping that um, this is of interest to people who uh, are kind of interested in numerical questions. So oh oh. So I you know here's a pic so. Uh, people have known for a very long time that, you know, you have this, these feed forward neural nets and they kind of like do all these max pool and averaging operations. And that vaguely looks, at least up until the last like classification layer, like some kind of RG-like scheme. And people have been talking about this for a very long time. But, you know, from my perspective, my question isn't like, how, why are neural nets physics? My question is, how do I design neural nets to solve physical problems, which is a different um, question. So, uh, you know, there's lots of specific prior work which say like some specific neural net is related to a normalization group for some specific, um, so maybe usually a little bit exotic field theory. Like there's this paper by Meta Schwab from 2014, with other papers since then. Uh, separately, of course, there's been this explosion about work on very wide limits of neural networks and sort of expanding around that statistical limit. Uh, and that is all, you know, some kind of like very sophisticated application of things adjacent at least to mean field theory, um, which is like the beginning of sort of ideas about the normalization group. Um, but, you know, what our work is about, how do you, I mean, we, I think it should be useful for designing neural networks, which are suited to particular conventional field theories, rather than saying that like your favorite neural net is about some unconventional field theory. You start with the field theory and you ask like, how do I think about this field theory? How do I study it using like any machine learning method I'm allowed to. I think this formalism should give you like good functionals, a good language to sort of make that connection. Yeah. 
So let me just say kind of what are the maybe three problems in my mind. Uh, so one, of course, is you want to try to sample from the probability functional. Uh, that's the sort of the basic problem. Then you can compute like expectation values of operators and so forth. Um, sometimes you want to compute scaling exponents. Um, these are, of course, defined in terms of the normalization group. So that's a little bit, you know, when you have like your favorite um, sampling scheme, uh, you really have to think about how the normalization group interacts with your sampling scheme in order to define the scaling exponents. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, the sense in which people have really been doing that so far. Anyway, and then a lot, another problem is uh, in certain like extended field theories, you might want to instead predict the, pro the, the ground state of the field theory, uh, which is a different problem from the, the two above, but sort of related because in all of these, you're going to need to make some assumptions. You can't sample from a fully general distribution, but you need to make some kind of onsets uh, for how you make the sampling problem or this ground state prediction problem tractable. So, you know, the normalization group is something that connects the long, the short distance, the long scale, long distance physics. So sometimes the short distance physics is easy, and the, like in QCD, and the long distance physics is hard. And sometimes the opposite happens. Uh, the long distance physics is like just some Gaussian thing, but short distance physics is complicated. So recently, there's been some kind of fairly popular work, uh, which applies uh, things like normalizing flows to develop better sampling mechanisms um, for um, lattice field theories. And you might ask, like, why does that work? Uh, is there a reason? And at least one reason why you might expect it to work better in this physical setting than it just works in some fully general setting is because of the normalization group. Um, because that says that, like, Mill, sometimes your theory actually is connected to a Gaussian theory or a free theory in some limit. So, like, the fact that you can find this path through functionals is not as surprising because there's like a principled connection between the two. So, um, yeah. So, you know. The kind of the hard problem is to sample from uh, strongly coupled physics at large scales and the short scale physics is simple. And maybe the sort of second best problem is the reverse one where, uh, you know, you just have like a Gaussian field theory at large scales, but at small scales, there's something interesting going on. And so one comment I want to make is that our work is actually related to a bunch of recent work in rigorous stochastic quantization. Um, and I just have some names here. Um, it's sort of Kind of developing and people have used uh, similar kind of like optimal transport methods to uh, prove aspects about like generalized like log Sobolev inequalities for specific field theories or to kind of study kind of convexity of the effective action functional um, kind of doing these like field theoretic analogs of bakery emery theory that go beyond just sort of the pure gaussian case and then their slogan is like the polchinski equation defines some kind of transport map between the gaussian free field and euclidean quantum field theory that's something that makes sense when like one of the theories, the larger small scale is simple. It's a, it's a free theory. And they're kind of utilizing the stuff to really do kind of like rigorous mathematics with it. Um, so, which is another reason why I said, like we have some formal derivation of why things are robust to lattice discretization, but it's so robust to lattice discretization that you can prove stuff for at least simple field theories, which is you know, usually not the case. Um, so the question I have um, for you know whoever is interested is can you take these flow-based sampling algorithms and can you try use our formalism to like get them to preferentially sample along uh, RG flow? Um, there seems there seems to us that there should be some sort of kind of good intersection of these two ideas. Uh, yeah. So we uh, so in general you know the normalization group has been an important onset uh, in numerical methods. So like these kind of uh, Simpler methods like DMRG and Mara have more or less given us pretty good answers um, to a lot of questions in one plus one dimensional field theories um, from a numerical perspective. And they all have these like tensor network kind of architectures, which have some kind of idea, normalization group ideas in, as part of their ansatz structure. So like they always look like this, you know, some of these are like isometries, some of these are disentanglers. Um, but in the higher dimensions, we, you know, we, we, do, we do seem to need new methods. People keep thinking about it. Um, and so there are these, kind of, now people are trying to apply modern machine learning methods. Um, and, but we know that historically, kind of using the renormalization group as part of the design of your network was important to get the numerics to work. And so, uh, you know, you might expect that various, that this really 
uh, should be doable. Uh, and uh, with our paper, at least I think we, you can, you can at least try to write down formulas which make sense. Uh, and so, um, yeah, like you really need to build the renormalization group in the structure of your sampling model, um, I think. And at least now you can start to do this in a principled way. So that's what's, um, for me, the upshot of this work. So, you know, we try to do the most initial exploration of this idea. You know, if you have this reparametrization, uh, this field reparametrization, then, okay, we write down our functional, we think of it as a loss, and then you kind of parameterize your reparametrization of the space of fields using some implicit parameter theta. You, you notice that this loss is differentiable. You want to do this, and then we have some discussion of why this particular loss is actually amenable to stochastic gradient descent type algorithms. This is like a special property of these losses. It's not, this is like, we're not saying this is true for a general function. So we sort of think about why, like if you have a confnet, maybe with a particular structure, sort of all the different aspects of this work should be relatively, like the different gradient steps should be relatively efficiently computable. This involves some, in, some, some identities and some tricks. Um, and there seems to be some structure to explore there. Uh, so um, this is like the dumbest thing you could do. This is, you know, you do one step of RG, kind of, and you kind of approximate it using a confnet. Uh, that's kind of satisfying. It's like, how do you learn a confnet that does RG for this field theory? Okay. Uh, that's the basic question. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, we're really, it's really more of like a framework where you, maybe your favorite question is like kind of going the other way, doing some sort of reverse RG. Um, you should be able to adapt the language uh, of this paper to that problem with your sort of favorite machine learning method. I mean, at least that's our hope. Okay. But at least this sort of gives you a principled connection between how do you train cognets which do RG for particular conventional field theories. So let me summarize. So uh, we established that the Polchinski and the general, the more, more generally the Wegner-Morris equation is the optimal transport gradient flow of a relative entropy. Um, this gives RG flow a somewhat surprising information theoretic formulation, although more work should probably be done in that direction. Um, there's this non-perturbative RG monotone, which pops out of that, which we studied um, and sort of studied this divergence structure. And this gives you some variational characterization of RG flows. And if you try to think about the numerics, it works better than you might expect naively. Um, there are tricks which make it more tractable than uh, for, you know, th there are various things which work out, which are satisfying. So let me speak about some sort of future directions, which we think are interesting. One is to it's probably good to generalize this to some richer class of field theories. Uh, and we think that should be possible because uh, while well, this Wegener-Morris equation was designed to do that, and uh, you know, but the, the one, you should really, one should really understand exactly the conditions needed for that. Um, as you know, we discussed some kind of initial numerical method uh, to compute forwards or G using uh, continents. Uh, that's probably worth testing, um, but there's, probably many other ways of using this formalism um, because like basically these optimal transport quantities just fit really well with sort of thinking with, with sort of ways of thinking about um, ML methods. So, um, you know, for example, it'd be very interesting to, to improve normalizing flow based methods using this idea um, or to try to use, you know, so now you can try to do like the reverse heat equation and then you know, study that using optimal transport and using that to get some onsets for like uh, doing reverse RG. Um, or, uh, you know, we could try to do something similar for you know, look for ground states. Uh, there's like some kind of connection we see because of this like reverse heat equation stuff, there's like some connection between two diffusion models. Um, and then, you know, we say that, okay, this is gradient flow of an entropy, but really, you know, really pinning down what that means in terms of information theory, I think is still uh, an interesting uh, question to make it just a little cleaner. Um, yeah, so these are some directions and we hope that uh, this work is interesting, whether you are a theorist, uh, I didn't really discuss the more theoretical directions here, uh, or whether you're someone who's interested in studying uh, field theories numerically, um, because we think that 
it, it makes the language of the normalization group and the sort of the types of quantities that people think about in machine learning, it brings them much closer together. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Um, maybe we can have uh, some questions now. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, whoever, uh, should I call on people? Can I jump in? Quick one. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so there's this map you've got between renormalization and this optimal transport problem. If mm -hmm. I go to a non, -renorm non renormalizable theory, yeah. Does the condition of non-renormalizability translate to in terms of optimal transport? Mm, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, it seems to be that you just shouldn't be able to like flow the theory backwards, right? So, so, so the heat equation, you know, one, one analogy here um, is the heat equation uh, can't be solved, you know, you can't solve the heat equation, the backwards heat equation with arbitrary initial conditions. But that's just an analogy. Yeah. Um, I don't think I can tell you something specific, some specific thing where like this optimal transport map will have this particular type blow up phenomenon. Um, I, well, but, let me just say, you know, what I've got in mind is mm -hmm. you spoke about doing a gauge theory. So you do a gauge theory and then if you can do a gauge theory, then you could do gravity. In, and so it'd be interesting to see the problems of quantizing gravity from this perspective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and there's also, of course, there's, you know, gravity is some kind of like uh, version of the Euler equation. You know, it's it, gravity is is sort of relate, you know, like, yeah, there, the optimal transport stuff and gravity is like kind of tied together better than one might expect. So I do think that's interesting from a very theoretical perspective. Um, I'm happy to you know discuss that. I, I'm sort of a geometer by training, and so I, I love writing down these like very infinite dimensional functionals and seeing what happens. Um, uh, Jesse, yeah. thanks for the really fascinating talk. It's it's great to see optimal transport appearing in the, in this context. Um, in your answer to uh, one of the earlier questions, you said that a free theory should flow according to its own entropy. With, but, if you do the Polchinski flow, yeah. Right, but but you could have chosen to not have that factor of two, as far as I understand, in terms yeah. of this Q function, functional. Right. And in that case, it would be then that Q would kind of be the endpoint of RG flow. So yeah. is, this, is that an interesting renormalization group scheme to consider, one for which oh, yeah, the theory yeah, doesn't yeah. run? Yeah, we thought about that. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I think it is interesting, Yes. Um, and I think we thought about like, what does it mean physically? Uh, but I don't think I can extract the results of that discussion at this time. But I do think it, like it, it's something where it, it has, you know, it's like, it has to do with kind of how you're, you're sort of, the, the way in which you're, I, I feel, this is vague, I apologize. I feel like the way in which you're suppressing different scales is scale independent in that version. But I, um, that's all I remember. I think, you know, with a bit of thought, one can give it like a meaningful physical characterization. Okay, thank that's you. Can I ask a question? Um, mm -hmm. You told us earlier in the uh, Cantor-Rovich formulation that yeah, what it control. gives you is um, uh, convexity sort of in this, uh, yeah. Uh, or in this kernel pi. Uh, yeah. So in in and then when you map it over, uh, when you do this mapping, how does that carry over here, or is that something that you kind of gain by making this connection? This. Uh, sorry. What, what, can you elaborate? On, can you just say that again? Just, just the fact that uh, when you told us about the difference between the Mong and the uh, Kantorovich formulation, it sounded like one of the things that it bought you was uh, convexity in the underlying. Yeah, problem. I mean, it's just uh, a basic aspect of the theory. So I was sort of mentioning it. Uh, like, it's not obvious that the Mong problem should have any solutions. Right. Um, but it's clear by some fairly simple arguments that the Kantorovich problem has solutions. So the way that you show the transport maps exist is you first show that transport maps exist in the Kantorovich formulation, and then you show that those things have to uh, come from the Monge formulation. 
So basically, like, you never actually split up points. You never, you know, you can think about this in field space. It's sort of interesting. It's, uh, uh, you know, like, why is, you know, do you ever need to take the density associated to a field at one scale? And when you, like, renormalize, you, like, split that density into two pieces. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's interesting to try to think about whether that kind of, whether the Contorius formulation where you can specialize it and kind of get nice numerical methods. Um, I We did not find a way of doing that upon our initial investigation, in part because like now, if you really think about the number of parameters, like now you have this kind of quantity of two variables, it's a little bit more challenging. It's just like, it becomes like very a very high dimensional problem. Um, but um, yeah, it is some kind of convex relaxation, which you know you could probably use. Uh, and in the more typical optimal transport literature, people, people do use that numerically. So that's my best attempt. Okay, um, Samuel Goldman, is that okay? Hi, this might be a dumb question, but I was just um, wondering about what happens when you move into Lorentzian signature, you lose the the fact that like you have a probability distribution, you now have like some amplitudes, yeah. right? And, but formally it seems like everything you've done sort of follows through. Do you, have you thought about like what that implies in like for Lorentzian RG? I haven't. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that, my answer is I haven't, uh, but that's a great question. Um, okay. If you, you know, if there are desiderata which are particularly interesting, uh, that would be cool to discuss. Uh, but no, I, I've sort of stuck with Euclidean theory for now. Got it. Thanks. Um, are there more questions? Uh, Jacob Swell, what goes wrong in higher dimensions when trying to apply the RG inspired tensor network methods? I don't know, they're slow. Um, it's hard to say what goes wrong in something. Um, so I'm not really an expert in that subject, so I'm not the right person to answer that question, unfortunately. There is an overflow issue with contracting the tensors. There we go. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, it's just hard to, it's just hard to do. One hopes that sort of ML methods give you much more efficient parametrizations because they, they do empirically do that in a variety of contexts. Um, but it's true that RG is important to get uh, the sort of layer dimensional methods to work. Okay. I got one more, if I can yeah, ask. Please. This is more so to do with enough. the uh, ML side in some way. I mean, yeah. when I'm doing field theory, a key part of it is locality that I have local fields. Yeah. When I do, when I think of ML and data, yeah, I don't have that whole thing of locality. I've just got a probability distribution, and I've not got anything that gives me something be near to something else and somehow when we do rg we think of that whole notion of scale as being short distance and long distance mm -hmm. so i'm sort of trying to figure out come up in various other instances with various other people and then trying to figure out this thing of what is the scale when we're doing this rg if we've just got a probability distribution of data yeah that's a much more general question um uh that's an interesting question um I, I really thought about like how would you design ml methods which are appropriate to physical theories so there you're going to have some notion of scale yeah yeah okay okay um, i i'm not so you do that you're not going to say this is an ml problem this is a cnn no 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 it's like yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the real i think like people have thought about like oh your favorite ML, your favorite ml method is it secretly doing physics and then in some cases yeah, yeah. very special cases yeah uh, and then people, of course, have tried to, the general structure of physical theory is useful to um, sort of yeah, organize. Yeah, yeah. But with this, we, uh, and, you know, maybe it's true that, you know, locality does occur a lot. So maybe it's true that if you think about how to design a sampling scheme for field theory, um, using kind of by like make by sort of incorporating RG, then maybe whatever architecture you come up with will also be good for other data modeling problems um, in which there's a notion of scale. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, the, our, our work is like really about sort of field theories. Very good. Yeah. Thanks. Um, but it's true. I think like taking uh, these sort of more modern like ML sampling approaches uh, for uh, Euclidean field theories, like trying to endow them with more refined notion of scale really is the question that I think is the most interesting one from a numerical perspective with respect to our work. Uh, yeah. Samuel Goldman, do you have another question? Or 
Oh, no, sorry. Maybe I raised my hand by accident. Sorry. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, I think uh, Jordan, also, who's in the chat, also answered this in part this question about Lorenzian signature, which is, I think he's saying, yeah, you try to analytically continue it. Um, but see what happens. Okay. Uh, if there are no other questions, then maybe we will uh, end the seminar here. Um, thank you, Simone, so much for a really uh, fascinating talk. Mm -hmm. um,